Hi, everybody. My name is Lars Nelson. I program for Austin Film Society, uh, and we're so honored to be joined across uh, the country from, with our friends uh, Alex Rivera and Christina Ibarra, who've made a film that hopefully you've seen by now, and if you haven't, hopefully you'll check out, uh, called The Infiltrators. It's a really fascinating movie that's, uh, that incorporates both sort of narrative film techniques and documentary techniques uh, to be really one of the most riveting and I think most entertaining films that you'll see in a long time. And if I'm just telling you about this film, you might not get it, but it actually is super riveting and engaging. Um, but first of all, I want to talk to you guys and ask you guys a couple of questions. I think sometimes one of the rewards you get for making a really good movie um, is that at all the Q&As, everybody just wants to talk about the issues and not about the filmmaking so much, um, which speaks well to you, how well you made the film. But I do want to ask you a couple of questions because this is not a, um, um, it's not a standard documentary. It's not a standard narrative. Um, and it doesn't do what a lot of documentaries that use um, reenactments do, which is kind of make these make them kind of a little bit sort of cheesy and removed. It thrusts you right into the dramatic action. So you've got this documentary part that's really engaging and exciting. And then you go in um, for the reenactments and it's really well acted and really well directed and all of that. How did you guys decide to do it that way? Hi, well, thank you. Um, you know, so Alex and I uh, have been making films for about 20 years separately. And um, he, he's, his strength, I would say, is more like experimental and uh, fiction, like science fiction specifically. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. mine is more documentary. And, you know, when we um, met the infiltrators, we saw a chance to tell a, a riveting dramatic story that we thought was really important. But also we saw a chance to blend our strengths together um, and kind of see what we could come up with um, in terms of telling a story that was kind of almost just like halfway there. You know, we only had half of the story because what we do in the film is we follow the infiltrators as they plan um, to get detained by Border Patrol on purpose. They're undocumented young activists and they're looking for a way to stop deportations. And so um, the way they decide to do this is that they will get themselves detained and stop deportations from the inside. Once they're inside, they also have to stop their own deportation. And we also lose them from our camera, um, from the observational lens. And so that means that now we have to look for a new, new approach to illustrate what happens inside the detention center. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so, yes, yeah, so we had this challenge, like Christina's mentioning, of like we, we, we had been documenting these activists that go into detention. And then after this whole story, after we filmed it, we were outside the detention center with the support team on the outside. And then after the filming was of the documentary element was done, we realized we have half of a great film here. We have the outside story, but not the inside story. And so we thought about animation. We thought about just working in audio. We thought about a bunch of different ways to depict what is intentionally invisible, right? The inside of a detention center is a place we can't see because we're not allowed to, because the corporations and the government that control these facilities don't want people to see. So how do you see what you can't see? And so we ended up pivoting, inspired by the creativity of the activists to uh, reenactment. And, um, and then just to your point about hy hybrid films, Speaking for myself, I don't really love a lot of the hybrid films. Somehow they often feel, even when the recreations are done masterfully, like Ella Morris's Wormwood or um, American Animals, none, they're always structurally sort of cursed by something, which is that the reenactments happen narratively in the past. So you have like an interview layer where someone's telling a story and then you kind of flashback to the reenactments. And we wanted to do something different where the sort of story clock move forward in time. So you start, you watch a documentary element, you see, you meet a character, then they get taken away, turned into an actor, pick up the phone and call the documentary. So the two lines move forward in time. And that was exciting to us, mm -hmm. the cross cut between reenactment and documentary in simultaneous story time. So we're yeah. in the present tense as much as possible. Like, yeah, that's such, a, that's such a great way to put it. Yeah, and, and I, I have to admit that when I heard what it was, it's like, oh, there's reenactments inside. Having seen, as you guys have too, I'm sure seen so many sort of reenactments that don't quite work or don't quite mesh. Um, I was I was thinking, oh, I, I wonder how they're going to pull it off when other people haven't. And you did, you know, it's just all there. 
Um, fakery is, you see a lot of fakery in documentaries, or I, I feel like I see a lot of documentaries that actually outright fake whole scenes. I don't, maybe I'm, I don't know, maybe I'm just reading that into it, but that sort of feel a little bit that way to me. Um, this never feels that way, of course, because you are explicitly, these are actors, it's a setup, so we know all this is happening. And then it also doesn't have that unsolved mysteries kind of remove, you just really go for it, which I really salute. Um, just how well that's done both both sides of this if you want to say that there's two sides of it are just so enormously well done that i mean i think it just it stands up with other really good narratives and other really good documentaries and it's just all there um and it's riveting it's just so exciting um and one of the things that's so exciting is that you've got very marco um your um infiltrators um and everyone that they're sort of working with is taking such a huge personal risk um, how, what, what are these people like who take these incredible personal risks? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, meeting them was really quite, um, uh, surprising, you know, uh, because, you know, they're doing what everyone has been telling them not to do, which is to out themselves and to turn themselves in. Um, and so, you know, that takes a certain kind of radicalness, you know, and so they're, I would, you know, we see them as, as more of the act up of the immigration sure. uh, reform movement, the undocumented reform movement, because they are, you know, doing things that everyone says they're not going to succeed in doing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they're, they're, they're fun and rebellious and, and politically sophisticated strategists, you know. This is one of the things that we love about um, this film is the opportunity to show an immigrant story where you don't have someone who sees themselves as a victim or um, as a sad tale, but it's like uh, so people who are fighting back and um, empowering themselves, seeing their own power, and you know, really, really understanding the system, the the um, American government uh, better than I do. You know, it's just like they they really know what they're doing. Yeah, it's kind of an irony that like you look at these people and and like all of their uh, the strength of character, and you're just like, yeah, these are actually the kind of people that everybody wants in America. <laughs> you know, <laughs> people who are strong and believe in their values. It's like, yeah, that's that. This is what America needs: is these people who are you know ironically or h horrifically being you know excluded from our country often. Mm -hmm. um, so this. The events of the film take place during under the Obama administration, um, and even I believe that it was sort of it was one of the sort of thoughts is that like oh the the Obama administration is saying such nice things that it gives us possibly some political sort of leeway in order to do this because Obama's already said that you know he he is pro immigrant pro dreamer. This is a very different world now. Um, un, under Trump, what, what all has changed? Do you feel like it's gotten a lot worse since? It seems obvious, but do you feel like it's gotten a lot worse since um, the events of this film? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's hard to say sort of better or worse. I mean, as simple um, terms to characterize all the change. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very different landscape under Trump than it was under Obama, um, but not in entirely predictable ways. Like overall deportations are down, actually. Um, under Obama, he was hitting about 400,000 deportations per year. Under Trump, I think he's been in like 230, 250,000. So the numbers have actually been overall lower, but the number of people in detention is higher. Mm -hmm. And obviously um, the kind of deliberate attacks on the family structure, um, using the sort of kidnapping of children as a, as a political punishment for, for refugees and, and, and migrants, I mean, all those are sort of newer phenomena you know there was family detention under obama but generally the families were kept in the same facility so it's but it's not as clear as like under obama it was good for immigrants and here it's bad not at all um the apparatus that trump has been using was built and developed under obama and that was partly why we wanted to make this film was to look back and see like this sort of storm that we've been living through it had been brewing for a long time and the previous administration, the eight years they had in power, you know, they did do DACA after being protested by the dreamers. They gave that little protection to the dreamers, 
that's kind of it. Beyond that, that previous administration built this massive system to uh, control and punish immigrants that then they handed the keys over to the Trump administration. And so revisiting that, especially when maybe who knows what will be happening in a few months. Maybe we'll have a President Biden. Who knows? But so re- revisiting that history seemed important to us. We don't want to let the kind of nightmare we're living through now give us an illusion that we had been living in a, a dream. You know what I mean? This has been a very complicated political question for a long time. And this is that we hope this film is one way to kind of unpack that. Um, I want to ask you, uh, I want to ask you about some of the folks in the movie, but I want to wait and ask that as my final part of talking to you guys, because some people haven't seen it yet. And we'd like them to just be able to kind of switch it off and then get back to it later after they've seen the film. Um, but so before we get into that, tell me what you guys are working on now. So um, I'm working on a uh, feature film uh, set in Honduras, um, and it's following um, the coming of age of uh, some young women who are trying to prevent joining the exodus of migration um, and their um, connection to this uh, 93-year-old uh, Catholic nun, this rebel nun, who is uh, helping them, you know, th- through this process. Cool. <laughs> it's a documentary. And yeah, and I, I'm... Um... Let's see. I it's not, I can't announce it yet. I don't think, but I, I think I might be, you know, actually getting a job in the film industry to to write so to write and direct a film um, based on some pre existing IP, a kind of a Latino superhero who's been out there for a long time. But I'm writing a kind of um, a story about uh, taking this kind of classic Latino icon and repurposing him um, as a kind of undocumented hero on a vigilante mission against ICE, diving into the nexus of um, immigration enforcement and big data surveillance is kind of the, the, the sort of story world that I'm writing inside. So I'm working on, uh, it's a fiction film and, and for a for a studio. Um, uh, that's, yeah, so doing that right now. And uh, we'll see, we'll see where it goes. But it's a lot of the same thematics that have been in the other work, but um, mm-hmm. it does feel like the end of the world. And to me, it feels like the end of the world because I've been trying to kind of crack the Hollywood thing and try to find a place to do work that has integrity and is exciting politically inside of the system uh, for 10 years and never been able to. But it feels like the end of the world because I might actually be getting a, a Hollywood job here. So. Well, that would be amazing if that happens. It's, it's not about uh, Rodolfo Huerta, is it? No. Okay. All right. Okay. Just wondering. <laughs> I figured I would code my language when I asked. Um, good to know. So, um, all right. So, for everybody who's uh, hasn't seen the Infiltrators yet, you should probably tune out now because we're going to talk about some of the stuff that happens at the end of the film and what happens to some of the folks that are in the film. Um, my cat's going to chime in too. Um, so, um, I, I'd I'd love to know. There's a really special person in this. There's a lot of really special people in this film. But once we meet Claudio Rojas, there's a real sense that this guy um, is kind of the beating heart of this film. That in a lot of ways, this is kind of a lot of he embodies a lot of what it's all about. Um, And I know that uh, when I saw the film at um, South by last year, he had been called into Broad County. Um, for a check-in, and I, I gather that they did not let him back out. Yeah, that's right. What's happened to him since then? Um, yeah, no, so it, it, it's been, this film has been an incredible ride, but after its premiere at Sundance, where we were so um, blown away and honored and surprised that we won two awards there, uh, and we were kind of in the afterglow of that. And then Claudio went for another check-in with ICE because he'd been freed now by that point in time for seven years. He'd been out of detention for seven years and goes in periodically just to say, look, I haven't committed any crimes. And the government typically stamps a paper, says you can stay, cool, check in in a year, stay out of trouble. And um, But uh, in February of 2019, after the film premiered, they detained him at his check-in. And they've been doing this to lots and lots of immigrants. But the way it happened, in Claudio's case particularly, raised a lot of red flags. And people on his team, um, his family, um, a lot of us believe it was kind of retribution for speaking out, essentially. 
and is part of a pattern. The Trump administration has been detaining um, lots of immigrants who become known because of their speak at, their speech, because they're protesting, because they're working as whistleblowers. They come out of the shadows and ICE turns around and grabs them and deports them. And so we're involved right now with attorneys that are working on a basically a First Amendment defense for immigrants, saying that ICE cannot punish people for speech. They've got 12 million undocumented people to deal with whatever they're going to do, but they can't go out and target people for, for being in a film or for going to a protest. That's some fascist shit that we're not supposed to have here. And so um, Claudio has a great attorney named Alina Das who's been actually winning in federal court on behalf of another immigrant developing this First Amendment defense. And um, she's fighting for him. And then we're also hoping to use the release of the film as a chance to elevate um, his story and the case, the cause in general of, of immigrants needing the freedom to speak in this country um, safely and without fear that them or their families are going to be targeted. Mm. Yeah, and, and uh, when we went to visit him when he was being detained, um, he uh, we talked about the film and we talked about how he felt about his story. And he said that um, he really enjoyed talking about his story and he enjoyed talking to journalists because it gave him a sense of hope in a situation where, where otherwise he was just felt hopeless. Like he just, just torn away from his new grandson. Um, he has another one coming now. Um, and he's, yeah, he's been separated. It's been a couple of days ago. It's been, it was a one year anniversary of his deportation. Um, and, but, but yet he's still, uh, he's still um, an activist. He's still telling his story. That's great. And, and I believe that in addition to obviously being um, one of the main subjects of the film, he also was with you guys when you were filming the, um, dr the dramatic stuff, the reenactment stuff, for lack of a better term, the narrative stuff, let's say. Uh, as kind of a technical advisor, is that correct? So that's correct. The um, I guess the the fiction scenes they have a documentary spine to them. Mm -hmm. You know, we have um, documents, internal government documents that we got from a FOIA, Freedom of Information Act request. These in, internal, these are really in depth sit down interviews with the infiltrators, uh, with Claudio, with other detainees who are inside the detention center. And then we have Claudio being on set with us. Um, working with every department from the art department to, um, you know, uh, working with cast, with dialect, mm -hmm. um, you know, to, to really uh, bring to life um, these scenes in a visceral way. And uh, it was it, it was a very moving. Um, he he uh, end, ended up having to, um, you know, just recognize, I guess, the the this had this was over now for him. You know, like this is a part of his past. And it was it was. It was uh, therapeutic, I think, for everybody. Sure, I can see that. Um, and and there are a number of other. The, it's a film full of heroes, you know, from Mohammed to Viri to Marco. Um, uh, what have they been doing? What, are there any updates on any of the other folks in the film other than Claudio? Yeah, so everybody's kind of doing their thing. I mean, the group came from around the country to be in Florida to do this action back in 2012, and since. Since that time, they've kind of gone back to their to their worlds, you know. So Vidi is in North Carolina doing deportation defense. Mohammed's kind of moving around the country, working on different campaigns. Marco is in New York. He's actually fighting his own case. Mm -hmm. He uh, it's a sort of long and complicated story, but he has an asylum claim that he's trying to um, to win so he can stay in this country. Um, and he's in New York with his family and but doing his activism. Um, yeah, so everybody's kind of just doing their thing, but but to your earlier point, I mean, under Obama, there was this weird moment of contradiction where the detention and deportation system was ramping up full speed ahead, but the president would go on TV and speak poetically about immigrants and about dreamers. And so this little group was able to hack that moment. They were able to use their bodies to put that contradiction on display, throw themselves at the detention system and say, wait, I thought you said you're not detaining us. You know, what's going on? Um, and right now, uh, one of the big changes is there isn't that contradiction. The administration is saying awful things about immigrants and ramping up the system. And if you speak out to denounce the system, we'll grab you first. And so 
the activism now has taken kind of a different shape. Um, and a lot of the action seems to be maybe in the courts. Um, so it's, it's a different moment in time, you know, and uh, that was the sort of, we could feel that coming when we finished the film. We could sort of feel the storm clouds on the horizon. And so that was sort of where we wanted the film to end was with this sort of sense of instability or not knowing what was coming. And it's, it's, that's, you know, and those, those, those dark feelings have obviously been borne out, you know, in political reality. It ends up feeling like kind of a, like a really particular moment in time, uh, like a capturing a particular moment in time that's also kind of timeless because, you know, it's a, activism is never um, over, you know, activists pick up where, um, and are inspired by activists of previous generations, obviously, um, and this, because you guys have documented this, this is a, it's a document of activism that can be used and reused. Uh, we can watch it. We can learn some of their mistakes. Um, we can also learn from their successes um, and also be emboldened by their strength of character, I think, also. I think all of those things are enormously valuable um, in the film that you've created. I, th I think it's a really fantastic film uh, that I'm looking forward to rewatching, and I hope, um, I hope you guys are feeling very proud at having made this film because um, it's really something. Very well, nice. Well, thanks Thank so much. You. It's really awesome. What, yeah, lots of different feelings all the time, but I'm I'm really um, proud to be able to show it in Austin where I studied. So I'm excited about that. Yeah, UT Austin <laughs> right here. UT Austin RTF. Yeah. Well, uh, AFS is very proud to have, in some small way, um, helped you along uh, at some point in your in your life and career. So. Um, <laughs> If, if we, uh, anything that we can do for you, we're, we're standing by to help. So thank you both so much.